All right, we are nearing the end of this study um, with, I believe, two more weeks after that. Um, I want to back up a little bit because a couple of points I made to make last week and I didn't because I was, I forgot. <laughs> Basically what happened. I got home and went, oh, here's two points I need to mention. So I'm using my mental capacity. I will do them this way. So I better say them quickly or they'll be gone again. <laughs> All right. Number one, um, then there's no immediate, uh, well, let me back, uh, well, I don't know which one I need to say to you first. But okay, we'll use this one. Um, there is not an actual connection made in scripture, but there's an interesting situation that happens when Jesus says on the cross, I thirst, and they <clears throat> they take the uh, sponge of vinegar and put it up to his lips. They use a hyssop branch stalk. Now, hyssop was a very stable uh, plant. It grew near the seashore as a general rule. And it was worth, it had its value, but it wasn't like a wooden staff. So why, why would they use his, that is a plant? Well, maybe they used it with everybody. This is where I don't know. Don't know what they did. Maybe they used it all the time. But it makes for an interesting thought pattern if you will recall back in Exodus, way, way, way back there, and right at Passover, uh, when, when the Israelites were given the rules of what to do in order to keep the, uh, uh, their firstborn from being killed, uh, if you recall, they were to put blood on the doorpost and on the, but specifically they were told to do it using a hyssop. Um, stock. And there, there's no connection that I can find. I mean, you know, the one, one necessarily connects to the other, but it is interesting that in both cases, uh, in, in the in Exodus account, it's God ordered. I mean, that's what God said do, and they did. And in uh, the accounts of the crucifixion, it's, it's what they used. So that's a thought. Now, I'm going to expand on that thought a bit. Now, hopefully, giving you another thought that you may or may not have considered. This one is not in scripture either. It is more uh, historical uh, <clears throat> information, background, if you will. Um, as a thought, how tall do you think the cross was? Now, the reason I ask that is because the pictures that we see, paintings, old, I don't know if I've seen any current ones, but the older pictures, some of them have the cross halfway to heaven. <laughs> okay? And everybody's looking up like this because everything's way over their head, literally over their head. I would suggest to you that the cross was nowhere close to that tall. In fact, I will suggest to you, though I can't prove it, uh, that it was almost at eye level. In other words, they have, probably have, now none of this was uh, laid out in scripture. So we're, we're talking about historical ideas and uh, looking back in secular material to get this. But generally speaking, <clears throat> They had, when they had an area, when the Romans had an area where they performed crucifixions, which would be the case of Golgotha, uh, they had holes dug for the cross to be placed in, or that was already done. Well, if, <laughs> unless they dug an extremely deep hole and had an extremely long beam, if you drop the beam in the hole and it's eight feet over your head, probably the weight of the person on the cross would possibly even cause it to break, depending on you know, how sturdy the wood was. 
But if you drop it down to more of an uh, barely, you know, reasonably above eye level in your thinking, uh, there are several things that happens when you do that. One, it makes it a whole lot easier for them to make fun of Jesus on the cross, as the Bible says they do. Uh, they jeered and, and did, all, did all this stuff. Well, if he's eight feet up in the air, he's not here in any of it. So it just be rattled down below him. But if you drop it down to a much more close proximity to the to the crowd at the foot of the cross, um, then he can hear all of this and would be more logical that they would cheer and say things about him and so forth if they knew that he could hear it. Also, uh, the things that Jesus says on the cross are going to be a whole lot easier to hear and understand if you put the cross down close to the people instead of having it eight feet over their head. Now, God would hear it all. Uh, it would all be recorded. So, I mean, it's possible. But it makes more sense if you drop that level down to where when he says things, the people around him can hear it. So, um, I, would, I want to challenge your thinking. And you don't have to do this. But when you think of the cross, and you think of the crucifixion, try to get that uh, at least give me equal equal time of uh, getting that picture you had or that flannel board picture or whatever. Because even the flannel board picture, the, 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 the cross was relatively tall. It wasn't uh, halfway to heaven. Now, I've seen some, honestly, I've seen some artists' pictures that, <laughs> uh, you know, it would, it would almost, it was almost above the oxygen. Well, where they had to cross, but uh, and that would tip over really easy if you tried to try to do that. But anyway, I'm just mentioning that to you for your consideration. Um, I will, and then I've got one more story to talk about with with relation in relation to the crucifixion. <clears throat> some of you know me well. Uh, some of you don't know me as well, probably. But um, those of you who know me well will probably remember that I am extremely critical when it comes to, well, I can just stop right there. <laughs> you know. But we'll, we'll delineate it out a little more. I'm, I'm extremely critical on uh, religious uh, movies, videos, and things like this. And, and my view being that they should be uh, Biblical, as opposed to man-made created things. Um, I'll skip that. Okay, <laughs> I was going to get more specific, but I, we are recording this, so I better not. Uh, I'd like to come back to you next week. Uh, but anyway, well, why not? <laughs> I'm within two weeks of being through anyway. <laughs> If you've seen the videos, any of the videos of The Chosen, I have a very strong, very, very strong concern because so much of what's in that video, now the, the man that made the video tells you in the first one, okay, uh, before it starts, there's a, there's a caveat there that says, this is not taken from scripture, it is taken from the viewpoint of the people who lived around Jesus and how they would have reacted. Yeah. First of all, most people don't read the caveat. Secondly, from that point on, it's never mentioned again. So if you miss the first video and you miss that, you don't know what the point of these videos is. And it is possible, I know for a fact, because I've had people ask me, it is possible to not know for sure whether what you just saw is in the Bible or not, because it's all put in together and it all flows well. It's a well acted piece of material. Uh, and my only objection is that they take great leeway with what they put in the video. And if you don't know your Bible, you don't know what is and what isn't biblical. All right now. Okay, now. A number of years ago, quite a number, 
There was a movie, it didn't, I'm sure it didn't score well in the box office. It wasn't anything like the Passion of Christ or anything like that. But it was the story of Jesus. I'm not even sure what the name of it was, the exact name. But it was the, the, the story of Jesus from the book of Luke. And I was I had a friend who had worked with the people who, who did that movie. It was a commercial movie. Well, just a church movie. It was a commercial movie. And he called me up and he said, I have a challenge for you. And I said, okay, I have a pretty challenge. He said, I want you to go see, and he gave the exact name. I said, I want you to go see it. I want you to tell me everything that's wrong with it. <laughs> well, of course, that wasn't too hard. He knew me quite well. And he knew that I was going to do it anyway. But that was what I was supposed to do. So, I went to the theater and I watched it very carefully. And it was hard to find anything wrong with it. I mean, it was the most biblical movie I had ever seen in my life. Uh, the, most of the dialogue was directly out of scripture, I mean, out of the book of Luke. It wasn't made up, it wasn't created. It was, and of course, they had him doing things which uh, you wouldn't, scripture wouldn't deny. That he did it the way they showed him doing it, or did any other way to make it different. But um, uh, when he was preaching, for example, he, there's this sermon on the plain that's called in Luke, which is a similar, very similar in much of it to <clears throat> uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, many of the same verses and uh, words and so forth. Well, in the movie, Jesus is walking along. And the disciples are walking with him, as well as the other people. And he's talking to them as he's walking on. And this is what he, he preaches, as it were, what, what's been called some of the plain. But, but there's no record in Scripture whether he was walking or standing still or up on a mountain or whatever. So it's very, you know, that's fine. Well, I went all the way through it. Very frustrating. <laughs> My job is to find something wrong. And I'm not having any luck. Finally, I finally got it. So I made a note of it, watched the rest of the movie, which was good. And I came home and he called me. He said, Okay, what did you find? Did you find anything wrong with it? I said, It's excellent. It is an excellent movie. <laughs> but I did find one thing wrong. He said, okay, what's that? And I said, well, when they crucified Christ, oh, well, prior to this, actually prior to the crucifixion, but in the crucifixion of Christ, they forgot to put the crown of thorns on his head. He said, okay. So let me ask you a question. Is the crown of thorns mentioned in the book of Luke? <laughs> <laughs> Look it up, it's <laughs> Now, I'll tell you that part is to let you know that when you, when you read scripture, be it John, be it Mark, be it Matthew, or be it Luke, you've got to read all four accounts to get the full picture. Because if you don't, they all cover things different levels. Some things they leave completely out. Well, Luke, for whatever reason, we well, have the crown of thorns. I don't know why, but he did. Now, I didn't know he did, so I never, <laughs> I never noticed that he did. Because I, I just related to the stories of the of Christ and pulling everything together, you know, from all the scriptures to get the story. So, if you read the account of John, John's account of crucifixion, or John's account of anything that the others cover. It's interesting that occasionally they rearrange things. They they um, uh, leave. They put things in. They take things out. But it's never contradictory. It's just that you've got to read the read all four accounts in order to get the full story. And if you ever have trouble remembering that point, remember that the crown of thorns is not in. The gospel of Luke. It's just not there. And I don't care 
how many times you read it, you can't find it. <laughs> so I re reread it for a numerous times, trying to find it. And I just think that's an interesting sit and an interesting thing because you can take one account and you can assume things, you will assume things that are not there, or you will assume things that are there that you know the others don't make a note of. So it's good to do them all. Okay. Now that brings us up to uh tonight. And um uh, we are in uh, chapter 19, and we're down at verse 38. And beginning there, it says, Later, <laughs> this will be after he died after his death on the cross. After he says, It is finished, and breathes his last, and gives up the ghost. Uh, later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of. Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus by night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, uh, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus by the chimney rack with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish, Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was a Jewish day. Their preparation, and since the tomb was new, by they laid Jesus there. All right. First of all, uh, both Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were both part of the same Hebrew. Now, the interesting thing about that is, if you think about it, it makes you wonder, it makes me wonder, and I hope it makes you wonder, uh, where were they when Jesus was on trial? Okay, you got a follower, I mean, you got two followers. Certainly goes back to Arimathea. He says he did. It says he was a disciple. Goes further with him than he does Nicodemus. But both of them have, have been associated with Jesus. So I couldn't have a wonder. Did they both not show up that day? You know, did they in absentia? Did they just not weren't there? Or if they were there, why didn't they say so? How did they vote? I mean, if it's a if it's a jury trial kind of thing, and, you know, and they take a hand count or head count, did they vote for him to be killed? Did they vote for him? You know, or did they? How would they not vote for him? You know, here I am. I'm keeping this secret. I mean, that's what it says. And uh, it's time to vote. What am I going to do? How am I going to avoid? You know, I, I have no idea. Bible doesn't say there's no way I can make, make any logical reasoning assumption about what they did. But it's interesting that they they were somewhere. They were either absent because they didn't want to show up or they were there and voted, avoided something or somehow. Now, all of a sudden, Christ dies, and these two individuals who were scared to death, uh, as it were, are living doing their work in secret, suddenly go, hey, let's go get the body. Now, would they have been that assured that all the Sanhedrin, all the Sanhedrin, the high priest, all the people who have been watching Christ off and on, wherever they did it, wherever on, long as they did, if they'd all been at home, <coughs> wouldn't they have born? Wouldn't they? Wouldn't it have been a lot? Now, all this is just logic. It's not in scripture. I'm saying it so you don't think I'm basing something in scripture because it's not. But if I were part of that group, uh, 
I would have wanted to see the end. I want to, I mean, seriously, seriously, I want to make sure the man's dead. I'm not going to take anybody's word for it because I've seen too many things happen in his life around him that would make me go, mm -hmm, I'm going to be right here. Right to the bitter end because I don't want anything happening to him other than his death. Since that's what I since that's my belief as a high priest or as part of the Jewish hierarchy who wanted Jesus dead. So I'm not gonna walk off and leave until I'm sure. Yeah, here they are. Um bringing him uh two Jewish <coughs> excuse me, two well-known Jewish men. And they both come and start taking care of Jesus. Now, that would get my attention. The second one, one brings the linen to wrap the body in. So we're not destroying him into an empty tomb. Uh, we're taking care of him by Jewish custom. Uh, we're bringing 75 pounds a spicy. That's a lot of spicy. I don't know what Jesus weighed. I mean, I have no idea, of course. But I mean, if he weighed uh, two hundred and seventy-five, added to that, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. I don't know how tall he was either, or how big he was. So you start trying to get all these spices around. I mean, it was like he was covered from head to toe, possibly, with spice. Why did, why, why did I make a point of that? Well, I make a point of it because Nicodemus thinks a lot of it because all these spices cost money. Uh, big, some of them are rather expensive, relatively expensive. And here he is putting, on, putting his money into spices to put on an individual that he secretly admired or watched out for or whatever. <laughs> Which, by the way, sidebar, if you, if you do see the chosen, Nicodemus is in it far more than he's in the Bible. Um, there's a lot more Nicodemus in the videos than there is of Nicodemus in the Bible, but that's the here and there. But uh, he's a devout man, but my goodness, you know, he wasn't related to him. He didn't have anything, and yet he spent all this, all this time and now we need to get him in the tomb because um, it's the Jewish day of preparation. And uh, there was a tomb nearby and it was empty. That's an interesting coincidence. I mean, you know, that there just happens to be an empty tomb right, running around. And of course, you put the body in the tomb. I don't, I'm not sure if the other uh, gospels indicate the ownership. I was thinking it does of that tomb, but it is an empty tomb. Now, I want you to consider something. If it were your tomb, now let's assume that it belonged to Nicodemus or to the Arimathea for a moment, would you want an extra body in your, in your tomb? That's kind of a spooky thought. No, it's empty. I bought it. For my family, or uh, whatever, you know, me, my family, how is now if it wasn't Nicodemus and it wasn't Joseph and Arimathea, then it's just a, a you can do which belonged to somebody. I assume. I mean, I don't think that Jews just had tombs sitting around waiting for somebody to fill it. Uh, maybe it was the uh, uh you know, rest haven funeral system that had in tombs that they sold out according uh okay. But, but my point is, you know, we know because we know the end of the story. We know the tomb isn't gonna be filled very long. It's gonna be empty again. So you can easily, you know, it's not gonna misplace your family uh to have an extra body in the tomb because it's not gonna be there. But they didn't know that. 
And so I'm, just, I'm, I'm making these things to you to get you to think about how you would react if you discovered that they put this, this, uh, I mean, this is not Jesus, son of God, as far as they're concerned. This is a man that was crucified with two thieves. So the, the citizenry of Jerusalem is not going, boy, my honor, Jesus was very my tomb. That's wonderful. They're going, you put that thief in my tomb. Uh, and who gave you permission to do that? Interesting thought. But you have the you have both the linen burial cloth and the spices put in there. And obviously, with 75 pounds of spice, you expect um, him to be there quite a while. You wouldn't waste any that much spice on someone for just three days. So, um, kind of an interesting idea. All right. Well, starting chapter 20, we will not finish 20 tonight, I guarantee it, but we're going to start on. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. All right. Now, the resurrection story is complicated. I and mean, it reads real smooth. There's nothing complicated about it. You just read there and go, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Sure. I knew that. That's why I always saw it. I mean, that's why I'm okay. I'm not trying to tear it down. I'm not trying to change it. I'm not trying to fix it. But I want you to think about something. Early on the first day of the week. Now, what time is that? And I, I don't mean a specific hour because it doesn't say. But what I'm asking you is, how do Jewish people keep time? From sun up, from sun up to sundown is a day, and then you have the night, the watches during the night. Okay. Now, if a Jewish person is reading this, which Jewish people did read this, what time of day was it? What is early on the first day of the week? Is it midnight? Is it from, you know, because Romans have midnight to midnight. I mean, they, we, we get our system from them. We mark days from 12 midnight to 12 midnight the next night. Okay, and that's a day. But the Jews have a six hour uh, opportunity window that they don't even account for as a day. But the day ends. Are you with me? It ends at six o'clock or at sundown, but generally speaking, six. Okay. Then it doesn't, it doesn't come up. I mean, it doesn't, the sun doesn't come back up until six the next morning. So you have this nighttime period that nobody can account for. And this has, and I ain't got an answer. I mean, give you a question that I don't have the answer for. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not arguing with this. I'm not trying to say it's wrong. I'm just saying I don't understand how it works. Um, I have talked to some Jewish scholars, and they get real fuzzy when you start trying to figure out uh, their nighttime schedule because they've got the watches and they tell you it was the first watch, second watch, third one. Fine. But when did morning come? When did daybreak come? When did the next day? What's counted as the next day? So what I'm saying to you is that it's possible that if it was at sunrise uh, on the first day of the week, that uh, he may not have risen. He could have, in theory, been buried. Now, I'm going to tell you why this doesn't work. Well, I'm telling you, it will not work, but I want you to see that yet. When was, when was the resurrection? Was it on 
Sunday morning. We, we would have a good answer. It has to be after 12 o'clock. Okay? But when you do the Jewish time, was it six in the morning? Was that when sun up came? But now remember, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb um, while it was still dark. At dawn, it says. But the people knew young. <laughs> At dawn, it was still dark. On the French lady, you can see this is why it's fuzzy. Well, uh, there's a variance in how you keep the time. And, and I don't, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of this. It doesn't, trust me, it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a test question on entrance into heaven. Uh, I hope not, because I haven't figured out the answer yet. But I'm trying to get you to think because so often we take familiar stories like this and we read them and we go, yeah, okay, maybe right along. You know, we're all in agreement, it's fine, it's right. And I'm going, okay, I'm not trying to throw a monkey wrench into it. I'm trying to get you to actually read what it says and analyze what it says as opposed to what you've always thought it said. So, all I know is that it was still dark. The sun has not come up. And now, depending on, again, you're right, there is a variance. You know, there are different versions will give you a different, slightly different, but it's right uh, still dark to dawn. Uh, she's not going to be out walking in the middle of, you know, she's not like Patsy Glenn. She's not walking after midnight uh, in the dark. So it's got to be getting close to dark, getting close to dawn. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just, it just, I want to think about it. Okay. So the stone been removed from the entrance. Now, again, historically, uh, this stone was not a round rock. Okay. Wasn't a rock that they stuck in a hole and, and uh, the Roman sealed it. What it was, um, it was a more like a wheel. The rock, it was rock, but I mean, it was a car like a wheel. And there was a cross that <coughs> ran in front of the entrance to the tomb. And so, what they would do is they would put the body in the tomb, any tomb, not I mean, Jesus to. The Jesus tomb is not special. I mean, it's, there's nothing unique about it. It's like all the other tombs. But <coughs> more than likely, uh, then the, there was a brace under this cylinder rock, if you will, that had been carved. And they moved that brace and it would roll in front of the opening of the tomb. And it was heavy. And you didn't just walk up and move it over a few inches or whatever. It, it, it was it wasn't meant to be moved. It wasn't meant to be open. And, and so therefore uh if uh you now if you have a family crypt, if you will, and there were some of those, they would be you moving in and out, but it still wasn't easy to it wasn't a, a rollers that just you know you rolled back over this way and over that way. So, Mary Magdalene walks up and she doesn't do anything because the rock, the, the, the inference has been open. And she doesn't want to go any further than that. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. The other disciple is? John. John, all right. The other disciple. Uh, the one she's loved, and she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. Well, there's a couple of things that are interesting with that verse. Um, how did she know they take him out? It doesn't say she looked in. It says she saw the rock and they moved. The stone and she left. 
I think she made an assumption that they had moved it because I mean, it'd be a generally wise thing, I suppose, to assume. But it doesn't say that she walked in. It doesn't say she looked in. Nothing. Um, and we, I know uh, who else was with her. Now, again, this is where it gets murky. Because when you start reading the other accounts of the re resurrection, there, there's people scattered all through this. They don't show up in John's account. But she says, we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Well, I can understand that. I mean, it's not something you normally rush into a tomb. Just you know, you you you, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm observing, but I don't have to actually physically go in there. Uh, but uh, then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. Peter doesn't slow down for anything. I mean, you know, <laughs> Peter hasn't slowed down since. He is caught. He's done everything impulsively. Some good, some bad, but he's done it impulsively. And some of it has demonstrated his faith, and some of it has demonstrated that he has no faith. Okay. But he's very impulsive and he, he does things. We would say David does he does things without thinking. Um so uh, uh, then Simon Peter. Who was behind him arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strip of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Okay. Now, when it says it's folded up, uh, there, there are different ideas. I mean, none of these matter as for eternity, you know, eternal salvation. But there, the way the Greek is uh, worded, it is it's possible, and I will say probable, that it wasn't folded up like in a square piece of cloth, but rather it was in the shape of the body of Jesus who resurrected through the cloth and didn't disturb the cloth. So the cloth is folded like it still had the body in it. This uh, New American Standard has rolled up. Rolled up, yeah. And it could be that. It can be after, he got, after you know, the, the angels may have rolled it up after he got out of it, okay? But my point I want you to get is he got out of the linen cloth basically without disturbing it. Now, compare, contrast that with Lazarus. When he raises Lazarus from the dead, what happens? Lazarus comes bouncing out of the tomb, I assume. I mean, you're, 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 you're mummified. You're, you're, you're put in there like a mummy as opposed to a daddy. Uh, but you, you're in there. Um, and how do you get? I mean, the only way you can do it is bounce <laughs> your right, so out. And Jesus is unwrapping. Okay, remember that? So did we talk about it later? Um, unwrap him and let him out. So who got Jesus out? You think the angels unwrapped him? Or do you think he probably just kind of came through the whole cloth and left it in whatever condition it would be left in? With him leaving it. Now, it could be rolled up, it could be any number of things. It could be rolled. It can be considered that, you know, that it was rolled up separate, like in a large uh, roll, or it could still be rolled and be the shape it was when they. I mean, now remember, you also have to get through 75 pounds of spice. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot, that's a lot of weight. So how did he get out? Well, the point is he didn't get out 
by his own physical effort. Right? He didn't, he didn't like the Gnostic. We didn't talk about the Gnostics at all, but I'm going to bring it up for right now. The Gnostics didn't believe that, that Jesus died on the cross. They believed that when he got close to death, uh, he was transported and another body was put in his place. Uh, that has uh, obviously that has some difficulty with what we're looking at here because somebody had to get him out, had to get the body out. I mean, the body's gone, but the cross still there. If you were going to steal a body, I don't advise that. And there's laws against it, first of all. But if you're going to dig up a body and steal it, um, or go in a tomb and take it out, uh, would you? Um, Leave the cloth there. I would find two or three guys with me, and I need 10 or 12. But uh, we just transport that body, cloth and all, because it was folded. Now, however, it was folded, it took effort to get it. You'd have to get the body unwrapped, the spices off of it. Carry it out, then go back in and, and want to fold the cloth, however it's folded. That doesn't work. What does this prove? It proves he was resurrected as opposed to uh, getting out on his own or being taken <coughs> out by someone else. So on my, my Conclusion would be that the cloth is there. The, the linen cloth that was around his head is laid in another spot. But everything's in order. It's not jumbled. It's not haphazardly put together. It's as though God took him out and allowed him out and left everything in place. Because he's no longer the physical body that he was when they put him in. He had he he has physical body characteristics, but he could do that just as easily as he raised Lazarus exactly. in the wrappings. Of course. And the fact that the fact that he left the wrappings there would be further proof that he didn't and that no one else was involved. And then the angels did not wrap him. And, you know, they did the fishery matter or take him in. No, he came in. I don't know how he did that. I mean, that's beyond my uh, understanding. Yes, sir. You think about him later on and talk about this apostle were all together in a locked room and he appeared there. Right. Okay, if he appeared through there, those cloths would be nothing holding him. You know, let's go through them. Right. Well, it's interesting, uh, and we'll, we will talk about that a little bit, but not much in, in, uh, in John. But, but he's, it's an interesting uh, concept because on the one hand, he's spirit. He's spirit to the point that he, you know, he gets out of the tomb. Uh, uh, and I don't think he rolled the I don't think he wrote the stone back. I think the angel wrote the stone back. I think back. But don't know that. But he really wouldn't, he wouldn't need to do that. He could just come through it. But what being, he, he's resurrected. He's a spirit, right? But what does he do with the disciples when he goes into that room? And where you were you coming, where he was, what does he do with them? He eats. Which means he's what? Physical. Okay. If he's all spirit, we're going to talk, we'll get to this next week. But if he's all spirit, how do you feel the nail, nail prints in his hands? He's got to be physical. Because a spirit doesn't have flesh and blood to feel. So you've got, this presents a very interesting situation to think through and not that we're going to have the right answer we don't need it 
Okay? Nothing I've said today of any of the degree of importance is necessary for you to know to get to heaven. Okay? How did it work? When did it work? But it does kind of make you stop and think maybe about some things you hadn't thought about before. And give you more, more <coughs> contemplation of how God reacts and reacts and how he can make a body both flesh and spirit to the degree <coughs> he can walk through walls and walk out of the tomb having been crucified and there for three days by the way and um, very quickly and I'll let you go and I want to make sure I make this point why do you think it took you know the three day thing is debatable. I got, I, mean, I know, I know the arguments and all that. But I'm, let's give me benefit now, right now. Oh, three days. Why did they wait three days? Friday afternoon, Saturday, and in the Sunday morning. Why to make three? sure that he was dead. To what? To make sure he was dead. Right. Remember with Lazarus. Remember with Lazarus. They left him in the tomb. Jesus left him in the tomb. For three days because that's how you knew he was dead. Because it was this spooky theory that the Jews had that you know, if you weren't if under anything short of three days, you might not be dead. Um kind of an interesting idea if you're not, but uh it came that also, of course, to fulfill prophecy and all that. I, I'm not trying to shortchange that either because that's true. But all right, so. We're going to pick up the resurrection next Wednesday, and we're going to get through it, and we'll get to the commission uh, the following Wednesday, and then we'll be through. So you can look forward to that, and I will see you next week.